back in our Father's Word how precious it is. We're doing Exodus, which means the going out, and going out it is out of what? Captivity, confusion, into the promised land. This is a type of how basically we stand right now. That's why most of these plagues that you're reading about that happened to the Egyptians are the vials God pours out in the great book of Revelation. In other words, one is an example for the other. So what goes around comes around. It's very easy to learn our Father's word by looking at past history to know what tomorrow brings. Now, <clears throat> he has, our Heavenly Father has hardened Pharaoh's heart many times here. Pharaoh didn't need really all that much help, I think. But anyway, God made it very clear in the New Testament in Romans chapter 9 where he said, I, I can take the same piece of clay and I can make a flower vase or I can make a chamber pot out of the same material. When he was talking about having what he had done with Pharaoh. In other words, he's the potter and when he uses someone, there's always a purpose. It was always prearranged and he knows exactly what he's doing. And he let us know in the last lecture the reason he's hardening Pharaoh's heart is not, not to make it hard on his own people, but the Egyptians are his people too. And he wants them to know that they should not be worshiping some fish god, some tree, some statue, something else, but they should be worshiping him, that he is God, he is Yahweh. And so it is. So we pick it up then today in chapter 8, verse 21, as he continues knocking on that door to get Pharaoh's attention to let the people go, to enter the promised land. So chapter 8, verse 21, a word of wisdom from our Father, and let's go with it. It reads, Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy house and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground wherein they are. You're going to have more flies than you can say grace over. Okay. 22, but a little different here. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth and in the midst of his own people. In other words, I hope you can draw from that. Many of you in these troubled times, and you, get, you let yourself get caught up into the excitement of the moment, and you don't realize God has his hand on you. He, he keeps the swarm away from those that are working for him. You don't have to worry about it. If you have the faith and the knowledge, God always takes care of his own. Verse 23, And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. Uh, this word division is padah in the Hebrew tongue, and it means redemption. I'm going to redeem my people. I want you to absorb that because he is our redeemer. He cares. Don't let yourself get caught up in the troubles of the world. Get all anxious about it when you're a child of God. It's such a waste because padah he is your Redeemer, and he has proved that over and over. Verse 24, to continue. And the Lord did so. He always keeps his word. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted, laid waste by reason of the swarms of flies. And I might add, what would make them really bad is all those stinking frogs they had piled up out there too. And, uh, and so it is. Verse 25, 
And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye and sacrifice to your God in the, in the land. But unfortunately what he says is, is my land. Do it in my land. He, he didn't want to let them go to their land. So he's still holding out. Got it? An enemy that you're dealing with can, can be uh, very difficult. When you're dealing with God, don't worry a whole lot about the enemy. Just observe him. Listen to him. God will sooner or later, he'll take care of business. You don't have to worry about it as long as you're doing your part. Now, that's important. You have to do your part in faithing and understanding and doing his work. Verse, the next verse, please, 26. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abominations of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? In other words, the Egyptians worshipped uh, cattle and rams and so forth. And if they, um, in their religion, in Pharaoh's land, that's the, that's the question, if we do this here, if, if, we, if we slaughter a, a ram or one of their cattle, a, a, a head of cat stock, and as much as they worship them, and dedicated to our God, they're going to be upset. They're going to consider that an abomination, which is why, very wisely stated. Verse 27, We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us, or he has commanded us, and he had. The Lord wanted to... Uh, God is not opposed to a little covert action. Okay. He said, get out there three days and then whoosh, hoof it, you know, haul out of there. So uh, our father knows exactly what he's doing, and he knows he's dealing with Pharaoh. And so it is. Let's go with the next verse, please, 28. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness only. You shall, you shall not go very far. Far, entreat for me. Go to God and ask him to get rid of these flies. Get them off of our people. Verse 29, and Moses said, look here, behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow, but let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Don't, don't let that happen again. And Moses did that. He went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. I'm going to put a word in for it. 31. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. Think about that. Could anyone argue that that was a, not a divine intervention? That they're swarmed to death, and then boom, they're all gone? Verse 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. I, I mean, he's a hard case. But again, I hope you can learn from this that God has all the patience in the world to save the Gentile even. He's saving the house of Israel here and delivering them from the Egyptian. But he wants, he wants them to know that he's God also, so that perhaps, maybe, they could attain eternal life. It is just the way of our Father. All people, were, all souls were created by Almighty God. They are all his children. He does not care only for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He loves all of his children that will love him 
and he respects them, treats them with dignity, and uh, goes to these ends to see that they have an opportunity. When they've been worshiping cows and, and frogs and many other things, here they're seeing the finger of God. The very, I mean the very existence of these abnormal things in closing around them at the exact time and place that the prophecy said they would. That's a very difficult thing to argue with. But that is God uh, uh, helping out as what he can to see that his plan is complete. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. The, the word Hebrews, it's important that you know the meaning of it here. It, it comes from Ebro. And the definite being translated fully, it means those people that crossed the river. What river? The Euphrates. Okay. Verse 2. And if thou refuse to let them go, and will hold them still, verse 3, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous marine, and um, that's a pestilence upon them. And, and so it is. Verse 4. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. Verse 5, And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this, uh, this thing in the land. Now, again, you worry about your stuff? long as you use your head and common sense, what, what do you have God for? Uh, somebody to kind of cry on your shoulder when you are down and out? Or, or do you know he takes care of his own? There won't be one head of the Israeli stock die. Pharaoh's going to lose every head of his cattle, and they worship them. Trust God. Verse 6, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Do you think God doesn't take care of his own? And, and what do you worry about? You know, you either believe God or you don't. There's no such thing as, well, maybe he does. No, he does or he doesn't. It's up to you. If you think he doesn't, then don't ask him for any blessings because you're not going to get any. But if you trust him, and if you ask his leadership when you've done all you can do, he takes care of even the property of those that love him and those that serve him. Hey, that's just the way it is. That's why this example happened so that you would know what you can depend on from our Father. Verse 7, And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. A hard case. But Father feels they need a little more shaken up here. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes, of the furnace and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. Why would God do this? Well, ashes is a it means um, he's going to turn a bunch of things to ashes for dear Pharaoh. And th this is the sign it's going to come from heaven. Verse 9 And it shall become small dust 
in all the land of Egypt and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Israel. I mean, you're opening up here to a heap of hurt. You know, an old boil just before it's ready to pop is a painful, painful thing. And if they're all over your body, you're one miserable um, uh, mankind. And that's what God's going to do to them. <clears throat> well, why, why is he doing that? He wants them to know that he's God. You can't lie to him. You can't con him. You can't play games with him. You have to trust him, love him, obey him, and be blessed by him. You can be as stubborn and fair of being this example set forth. But at the same time, our father is doing it out of love for the Egyptian. He wants them to know there is a true God. Verse 10, and they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, I mean, right out in plain sight, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with flames upon man and upon beast. That means they're already popping, right and left. They're a sick bunch of puppies, right, big time. 11. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. So, uh, there you, I mean, they were laden pretty heavy. And in a heap of hurt. Was any of this on the Israelites? Of course not. Why? Well, because God was redeeming them. It was not they that disbelieved God. And those that, dis, those that believe God are blessed. Uh, how about you? Where do you classify yourself in this? Do you truly believe? Or would you doubt all this? There comes a time when the rubber meets the rope. And... In this going forth, we're about to enter the promised land in this generation of the fig tree. It's, more, it's imperative <clears throat> that you love the Father, that you listen to him, but if you want to be blessed, you're going to have to trust him and return his love. Um, I, I mean, you know, you might say, well, how could I be so sure? Well, it's human nature. And God is not only natural, he's supernatural. If you, if you had a child, what that child would do is burden you in every way you could be burdened. And I mean, cause you all the harm that harm could be caused. Would you be over anxious to bless that child? I don't think so. If you loved them, what would you do? You would get the rod and spare the child. That's what you would do, biblically speaking. Uh, so that's kind of what God is doing here in both ways. He's showing love, tough love. But at the same time, he's protecting those that believe upon him. So uh, what point am I trying to make? That even in the very hardest of times, boils pouring out, God takes care of his own. Even when the times are rough and it looks like that bankruptcy is coming for everyone, God always takes care of his own that use common sense and believe upon him. That's an important lesson. I can kind of understand the Egyptians at that time maybe having a little trouble learning that, but I can't tolerate you not learning it because you know better. Verse 12, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. <clears throat> now that, that's a hard old trip. Verse 13, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, 
and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Now, oh, 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 now what did he say? Did he say, Let them go so they can all be free? That's not what he said. He said, Let them go that they may serve me. A little bit of, of work hooked to this, okay? Verse 14. And I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. I want you to know that. No cattle, no trees, no stumps, no shady worship. I want you to know I'm it. I'm Yahweh. I am the creator of all these things. Verse 15. And now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence that thou shalt be cut off from the earth. That's a tough old saying. Verse 16. And in every, in, in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. <clears throat> Don't ever forget that verse. That's a key to even what's happening here. I'm going to read it one more time for you. In the very deed of this cause have I raised thee up. Tom to Pharaoh. For to show in thee my power and that my name, what name was that? Well, he told you back prior, I, 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 I am that I am, Yahweh. My name may be declared throughout all the earth. And, and so it is. You see, this is a prelude to what the end is. That's why it's so very important that you absorb it, that you understand it. Because this is how it's going down. This, many people won't recognize it. It's happening right now in part. So you have to be alert and you have to observe. Verse 17. As yet exalteth thou thyself against my people that thou will not let them go. You keep playing the big cheese. 18. Behold, tomorrow... About this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. You know, Father can create hailstones weighing 180 pounds. That's a talent, if he so chooses, which will destroy anything. 19. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. It's going to kill them. Now here... I, I, I want, uh, do you see the compassion in that? Can you be fair a minute? That's our father telling him, there's a curse coming. I'm not happy. I'm going to bring a vial of wrath upon you, but here's how you beat it. In other words, if they believe God enough to take his orders and gather all the cattle in, they will escape this one. That's compassion from our Heavenly Father. I, I don't want you to read over that, and I want you to understand it. That every move he makes, there's a motive. There's a reason. And you always want to understand that. So here, he not only announces one, but he shows them how to be out of it. Even the Egyptian. Verse 20. 
he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. Now, can you analyze that a little bit? This word feared means revered. What did they revere? The word of the Lord. They were beginning to listen. Get rid of the boils, the flies, the frogs. We love you, Lord. See, it's working. Verse 21. Not, not all, but some. It's beginning to work. 21. And he that regardeth not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man, and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Do it. 23. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. Now, was this a terrible thing to happen? It only happened to those that believed not the word of God. How are you doing? I'm going to say it again. It only happened to those that believed not the word of God. Do you believe? Do you believe the word of God? It's more important now than it was even back then that you understand his word and believe it. Because then you are protected. Verse 24. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And I mean, that's, that's from zero to, uh, time. 25, and the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field, break every tree of the field. Um, how could they have prevented that? All they had to do was believe the word of God and do what he said to get them out of the field. He said, everything out there is going to die. <laughs> well, that's a good way. I don't believe he's going to do it. Well, get out there and wait and see what happens to you. Okay? I don't know if I want to take time to believe the word of God. Hey, that's okay. Have a good trip. You know, see what happens to you very soon. Or you can have the love and protection of Almighty God by believing his word. Because as he writes... In the great book of Mark, chapter 13, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Have you read it? You know, man only uh, fears the unknown. Once he knows how it's going to be, he's going to put a plan together in his mind, regardless of what size it is. He's going to figure some kind of plan of how to go through it, over it, under it, around it, or by it, or just ignore it. As long as, you, as long as you have read and you know what's going to happen, guess what? There's no excuse to be deceived. You should be blessed. Verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen where the children of, where, where, um, the children of Israel were was there no hail. God takes care of his own. I'm going to tell you something. Just as it is said that the great huge hailstones will fall at the battle of Haman Gog, uh, they're not going to fall on God's children, just as they weren't not here. That's what this is an example of. You don't, you don't have to worry about it. Well, why, why is God going to do that? Because the people that come against us from the north, God doesn't want them to know how strong our army is. He wants them to know how strong God is. God will destroy them. Then they won't have any problem figuring out God is God. That they should have believed the word. They should have followed the word. 
But then, you know, some people like to play church. That's a dangerous thing. Especially if it's a house that God's Word is not taught in chapter by chapter and verse by verse because they never really, if God's Word isn't taught, know what God really thinks. How He loves His children. How He protects them. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's why it's so important that you know and understand. No, the, the children in Goshen had nothing to worry about because God protects his own. Let's go one more verse. Verse 27. Pharaoh sent and he called for Moses and Aaron and he said unto them, I have sinned this time. Oh, the Lord is righteous and I had my people and I and my people are wicked. Oh, we finally converted him. Can you be had that easy? You know he's a liar. You know how many times he's changed his mind. And now he says, I have sinned. My people have sinned. You think you were having a regular old time revival here. But you better remember who you're dealing with. 28, he continues, Entreat the Lord, for it is enough, I've had it, that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall say no longer. In other words, I might even be glad to get rid of you. Okay. Good riddance. Well, again, would you trust that? Well, we'll see, won't we, in the next lecture. And so it is that our Father is so good to us. When you believe Him, follow Him, obey Him, as best you can, none of us are perfect. And we all fall short of the glory of God. But He makes up for that. That's why He paid the price on the cross, because He loves you and knows you mess up every once in a while. So He paid that price so that you could be forgiven for it. But you do have to believe His Word. That's basically what this, this lesson was about today, this lecture. Believe in God, and you'll survive. And I'm not talking about surviving in the flesh. I'm talking about surviving the eternity. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?